Have you ever wondered what it takes to make a marriage last? Have you thought about what it is going to take for your marriage to last a long time? Are you having questions and possibly doubts and worry and anxiety about your marriage because of the things you're going through? And maybe around you in your own family, you've seen a lot of divorces, others who don't make it. Maybe you have had friends who whose marriage have not worked out and you're worried, you're concerned about your own marriage because you've seen signs that are somehow pointing to the fact that maybe things are not going the way that they should and it brings anxiety. And it's very understandable if that's what you're experiencing, especially because divorce, the rates are soaring, as you know very well, right? And all these fairy tales that we hear about marriage and some people's marriage and, and all of that. And, you know, those things are also falling short. So this is a question that many of us have pondered. I remember when I first got married 38 years ago, and I'll be talking about that in this um, video, 38 years ago in 1985, I also in the early years, I was, you know, we just, we kind of figure things out and making things up as we go. Yes, we had, uh, thank God, my wife and myself had um, examples of longevity in marriage because her mom and her dad were married for, you know, umpteenth years until um, he, she died first and then he died much, I mean, a few years later, my parents as well were married for umpteenth years combined, possibly almost a hundred years combined in uh, parent, you know, my parents and hers combined, almost a hundred years of marriage. So can you imagine? <laughs> yes, it was a very long time until death. Truly, they lived up on until death do us part idea. And so having been married myself for 38 years, as I just mentioned, you know, I've learned a thing or two along the way. And here's what also has happened. You know, in my work as a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified relationship coach, you can imagine I have spoken to so many people, so many couples, actually hundreds of couples that I've worked with and heard their, hear their story. Some have gone on to successful marriage after counseling or coaching. And I may say that there have been a few. Thank God it's just a few um, I could actually can, if I recall, maybe it's, if it happened, I wasn't aware of it, but the ones that have happened basically under my watch, meaning that it have not worked out is basically a very small amount. So I have seen in my own personal journey and, you know, around me and in my professional journey, I have encountered people who've had not, you know, their marriage did not turn out well, and some who had some serious hiccups in their marriage. And so I've learned some things by watching them, listening to them, and my own story as well. You know, there was a study that was done several years ago, and I think if it was redone um, in, in recent times, would still have the same results, if not even worse results. But it, it did find that couples who were interviewed and talked about and, and talked to, those who've been married for over 30 years, right, um, and, and and counting, that they point to this one thing, which you will hear me talk about in this video, as the most important ingredient for happy marriages. Ha would you take a guess of what that might be? If you guessed um, communication, you are half of the answer that they gave. The other half was shared values, shared values. And, and they basically said these are two of the most important ingredients for a successful marriage, for longevity, and a happier marriage. So today I'm going to take you on a trip down memory lane and share you, with you the top seven valuable lessons I've learned over the course of my marriage and raised in a family. Now, of course, these are there are many, many, many lessons that I've learned so it's impossible to cover them all in this short video, as you can just imagine, and but are even to go in depth in these top seven valuable lessons. So it's more of a 30,000 feet overview 
that you will be getting, but enough to kind of point you in the right direction that helps you, will help you in your own marriage as well. So think of this as a crash course in navigating the life's ups and downs, your marital relationships with your partner, your spouse by your side. And, and hey, you know, who knows? Maybe you'd even pick up, I hope, a tip or two that we'll use, you can use to strengthen your own relationship, your own marriage. Now, I want to start with um, a Bible verse because this is going to be critical to our my conversation with you, my sharing these things. But I also want to say, you know, uh, number six and number seven um, of these seven valuable lessons Number seven, I believe, is the most important one, is the one that holds everything together. I call it the glue, and we'll you'll hear more about that when I get there. But also number six, I think, you know, it's one of those things where I have seen many couples, yet after many years of being married, have not yet mastered, have not yet done this one thing that I believe is so critical for marriages. And you'll hear when I get to number six what that is. So the Bible verse that I use is one that have been um, very much the, the, a part of my life for many years. You know, many times I give people gifts and cards and so on. And whenever I do, whenever I do, I, I would sign my name or make, uh, you know, something in the card or the gift. But I almost always put this verse there as well, because it's one of my verses that I believe it's, it's such a very incredible verse. It's Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, where it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he, God, will make your paths straight. I cannot tell you how many times I have to refer to this verse because many times in my marriage, my wife and my our marriage, many times we had to rely on this and because we were trying to figure things out in our own mind because the, the verse says, don't lean upon it. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have an opinion, um, have ideas, have an understanding, so to speak, about your relationship. Of course, you need to have those. But it says, don't lean upon that. Don't put your weight upon that. That's what it means. It means don't rest your weight upon that and the weight of your marriage and your life upon that. Why? Because it will give way. Imagine if you were having a a, a stick that had that wasn't a very thick piece of stick. It was kind of slender. And imagine that you're leaning on that and putting your weight on that. What will happen? That stick will snap right away because it's not going to hold your weight up. And this verse is saying, your understanding, my understanding is like that stick. It won't hold up when we put our weight on that. And he said instead, put our weight upon the Lord because the Lord is that thick, thick piece of wood that you can put all your weight upon that. No matter how much you weigh, <laughs> literally, you can put your weight upon that. It will never snap. It will never give way. It will hold you up. And that's why this verse is being so important. And you will see more about that. Why I believe it is the verse that has basically have been with us from the very beginning of our marriage. Now, as you know, you know, life sometimes or marriage throws us curveballs, right? And when it does, what do we do? Well, these seven top valuable lessons that I've learned, I believe is what will help you as well. So let's get into the seven lessons. Now, the first one, and by the way, this is not in any order. I would just say number six and number seven. I I, I rest, I kept that to the end because they're the most important, I believe, um, because everything else rises and falls upon those two, especially number seven. So, but just think about this as a loose way of putting all this together. The first one I have here is effective communication is key. Effective communication is key. Now, you've heard this many times, right? Because I think so many people, they would say we have good communication. Well, good is not necessarily effective because you can. good is very subjective, meaning that you might think you have good communication. Your spouse may think he or she have has also good communication. But the question is, is it effective? Is it making the connection that it ought to be made? Are you practicing all the skills that goes under effective communication, such as active listening, 
such as good body languages, right? Such as um, your ability to not just listen well, but to deliver well, right? It's not just what you say, but also how what you say is important. Those two are critically important. So that's part of effective communication. My wife and I had to learn this over the years because I came in with a type or a style of communication and she came in with a style of communication that were almost polar opposite. We were communicating many times past each other. We were communicating and not making the connection that we ought to make. And sometimes we got frustrated because I would think that she's not listening to me. She's not hearing me. She would think I'm not listening to her. I'm not hearing her. So can you imagine what that's like? So you can just um, ex imagine how what we did. We basically had to do this dance. And, and many times I can tell you, we had to um, say we're sorry. Uh, please forgive us because we missed the mark. I know I missed the mark many, many times because I pride myself into be a good communicator. And so I would use that and think it is her fault because it's her just not listening. It's just her not paying attention, right? And she could do the very same thing about me. So we were not communicating effectively until we've learned that. And I can tell you, this is a top valuable lesson that we've learned is learn how to be effective in our communication, right? Our style and understand the differences and know that differences are not good or bad is not one is right or wrong is just different. And we've got to figure out what is a sweet spot in our communication. That's the first thing. Hey, before we go any further, my team has notified me that more than 70% of you who are watching this channel is a new user. And I want to say thank you for being here. I greatly appreciate that. If you're finding this channel to be valuable and receiving value from these videos, would you do me a favor and help me reach more people so that they too can find value in this as well? To do so, all you've got to do is hit that subscribe button so that YouTube can generously spread my video to more people. And if you are feeling more generous, you can hit the like button as well. And I would really appreciate that. Now let's get back to where we were in our conversation. The second one, goes along with the first one to some degree, and that is patience is priceless. Patience is priceless, as you can imagine. Bringing two people from two different parts of the world, two different family upbringing, two different belief system, two different ideas of what marriage should be, two different ideas of what parenting should be, two different ideas of, you know, on and on it goes. That requires patience. I mean, I cannot tell you, this is something that I had to learn and this is not an overnight thing, right? Because there are times that we don't see eye to eye when we are communicating, as I mentioned. And then so what it is, if I'm going to learn to be the best student of my wife and she vice versa of me, we've got to be, then put aside our pride and our ego and what we want. We have to put aside who is right and focus on what is right. We had to put aside the fact that it's not about me and what I want is what the relationship needed. And so, as you can imagine, to get to that place where patience, I mean, we had to ride this wagon of patience over and over and continue even 38 years later, because at different times in our life and our stage of life, it requires different um, attention. It calls for different skill sets. And guess what? Every time they present themselves, we're going to have to have patience. We, you know, also patience in waiting upon one another <laughs> for different reasons, because uh, both of us had different ways of possibly, you know, of, of getting out the house and doing certain things. And, you know, sometimes um, they sit there and, and wait <laughs> and you're in the car, you're ready to go and your partner is not there or you are ready to eat and they're not home yet. Or, you know, you could name the, any of those things. That's why patience is so important. And the good news is God has given us this as part of the fruit of the Spirit. He has given us the patience. So if we need patience, God has given that to us. We have no excuse, really. It's because we just don't choose to be patient enough. You know, I can be impatient in driving. And 
I, I own up to that. My wife will probably say amen if she was here right now. And sometimes on the road, I don't practice much on great patience. So I know there's areas of my life that I'm still impatient in, but I have learned in our relationship how to be better at patience. Patience. My wife also have learned that as well, because if we're not, if we're not, we're going to be in constant battle, which means we have to give and take, which means it may not be perfect, which means it may not always be presented in a way, whatever that is, where it's like, you know, excellence, right? Now, I understand we should strive for excellence and all those different things, but you know what? Good is better than nothing at all. And sometimes we need to start with good. You know, I remember in school learning this, good, better, best, right? Good, better, best. So we move up this the, 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 the sequence of things. So if we don't start with good at least, then it's never going to become better. And if it doesn't, if it comes, becomes better, if it becomes better, then the chance is it can become best. So it's good, better, best. Patience is necessary. The third valuable lesson we learned is that love is a verb, not just a feeling. As you can imagine, when you first got into marriage and the honeymoon and the love, and you're riding that wave of, you know, your, your feelings and you're feeling like, man, all these chills and fuzzy, warm feelings, and that goes away really quickly. Reality hits in. You have to deal with a snoring husband or a snoring wife. You have to deal with someone who has the toilet paper rolls up one way than the other, or the toothpaste being squeezed from the top or the bottom, you know, all those different things. Now, of course, that's patience as well. But it's a love. It's a rem remind ourselves, because we love this person, it's not just a feeling. Because at times, I don't feel love. And my wife would tell you, she doesn't feel love for me. But because we know it's a commitment, it's an action, it's a thing that we do. We made a choice to love, right? Because Passion and feelings fade over time and they fade very quickly. But true love is a commitment and a choice. We learn and very quickly we had to learn this, that love needs to be paid attention to. We had to be very intentional at loving because sometimes I don't feel like loving. At a moment, my wife may have you know, ticked me off and I may also done the same thing for her. That's the last thing we want to do is loving actions. But we have to remember what love is. And 1 Corinthians, Corinthians 13 gives us a great idea about what love. You can read that for yourself, but it really talks about love being action things. We do these things. We, we show kindness. We're patient. We do not keep um, track of wrongdoings. You know, those kind of things, right? That's what love does. It's very, very active. So we've got to then realize that through these acts of service and words of affirmation and quality time and, you know, gifts, those are things we do to show our love. But we need to, need to understand, we have to understand what, how does our partner receive love and give it to them the way that they need it? So it's a verb, and I had to learn that very quickly. Number four, learn to compromise right? This is a constant dance, right? Learning to compromise because many times we want our own way. We want what we think is our truth. We want to win. I cannot tell you how many couples I've worked with who feels like winning is their ultimate goal. They don't want to feel as if they've lost something. I said to them, well, if you win something, guess what? Your spouse loses. And if they lose and you win, guess what? The relationship loses. Well, what do you want? So I will say many times, this compromise idea is so that the relationship, the marriage can win, which means that you and your spouse will not get all that you want. I cannot tell you how many times I've told couples this in, in counseling or coaching. I said, listen, you have to understand for the marriage to last and to have longevity, it has to be constantly deposited in, nurtured, right? Because Imagine the relationship being the bank account and you don't make deposits, but you want to make withdrawals. How does that work? So it's a constant dance where we are having to make these deposits into the relationship, right? So sometimes we need to bend to find a solution. 
that works for both of us. So it may not just work for you, it's what will work for both of us. You know, and that's why I sometimes when I use, hear the word compromise, it sounds very negative, like you are caving in, you're giving in. So I like to use the word negotiate. Negotiate for the relationship. Negotiate for that which the relationship needs. And how do you get there to give it what it needs, right? This is so critical. And learning learning the art of compromise to find common ground is one of those valuable lessons we had to learn very early, um, especially even in our parenting. We parented differently. So we had to learn to recognize how do we balance these things? How do we compromise our own you know, comfort sometimes because sacrifices had to be made. So this is so important. The art of compromise and finding common ground is essential for both a happy and a lasting relationship. Number five, and this is critical, right? Um, well, let me just say, no, number six and number seven is what I'm talking about, but five is also important. Marriage is work. <laughs> Marriage is a four letter word, work, W-O-R-K. But it's a re rewarding work, obviously. The more you work at your marriage, the more rewarding and the better it is. And you may say, Kingsley, you don't understand. I'm working night and day at my marriage, but my spouse is not. What do I do then? Now, that's a question for another um, video, but it's a very legitimate question. But in all things being equal, Marriage requires both persons to work at it. We've got to kind of roll up our sleeves and realize that we have to then, to do all the things, effective communication, patience and listening and all that, that's work. That's work. Any good relationships requires the effort. And so many times when people sign up for marriage and they recognize what they signed up for and the work it demands, they're like, oh man, I, I, I can't do that. It takes too much of my time. It requires too much of me. It requires too much sacrifice. Oh, I can't do it. Well, well, maybe somebody did not warn you that marriage does take work. Right? It takes work to make time for dating your spouse. It takes work to um, schedule things in so you can spend quality time together. It takes work to say no to certain things so you can say yes to your marriage. Again, I know it's not easy. We juggled for the first part of our, our marriage, I would say a third, the early years of our marriage, we struggled because I did not have a balance. And I own up to that. I am guilty of that. I did not have a balance, you know, because I wanted to push through my own agenda, what I want, my vision, and that became an issue. But, you know, thank God, we worked through that. We were patient. We compromised. We uh, communicated effectively. Again, we learned all those things as well. But it's work, and it's hard work, and it's fulfilling and rewarding work. That's the good news about marriage. Number six. Now, these last two that I said before at the very beginning, and you're going to see why I say these are really critical to any longevity. This is what you have to institute early in your marriage. And I find couples, you know, I remember one time I was counseling a couple. They've been married for 13 years. I'll never forget that. And they came in and we were talking about certain things. And for some reason, as we as listened to them, I'm hearing often over and over again, I and mine and, and me. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why is there still I and my and mine? in this relationship. And I started to talk about that with them. And, you know, I, in that session, I never forget. The couple began to, to weep, especially the wife. And the husband also was teared up because I said, you guys have been married for 13 years, but you have not yet, yet made transition into marriage. So what are you talking about, Kinsley? I said, the more I listen to you, the more I realize that you still are living a single life in this marital relationship because I'm not hearing the words that makes marriage work. And so number five, number six is no longer I and my, but us and ours. No longer I and my, but us and ours, right? You can add the word we in there as well. It's where you make a transition and you merge where the two becomes one, as the Bible says, 
when two people are joined together, they become one flesh. It's where, you know, and I have a hard time where people say, oh, this is my this. And, and I get it. There is, you know, I, I, how many homes, my closet, my sink, my bathroom, my account, my money. But, you know, this is crazy. These are things that undermine your marriage. It has to become ours. It doesn't matter who brings in the, the bacon, so to speak. The wife, if she is out working and the husband is at home, he's doing the home thing so she can do the out the work things and bring in the bacon. And if the other way around is still the same thing, both are joint working together to make it happen. So it's none of us, this idea of mine and, and my and no, it has to become us and we and ours. That's what marriage is all about. It's no longer yours, it's ours. And so it, I cannot tell you how many times I, I hear couples say, oh, uh, can I have a, my own account? So why would you want to have that? Now you can mutually agree. And of course, I'm, I, I won't get into all of that, but there can be a mutual agreement with conditions about that as well. So it still become ours. It just happened to be one person oversee that, you know, like, you know, my car, your car means that you don't drive my car. You what? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That's, that's marriage work. It's our cars, but you might be the primary driver. But if I want to jump into it and drive, I should be able to, and vice versa. That's what no longer I and my, but us and ours is all about. And you can hear I get work up about this because it irks me. <laughs> Number seven, the most important one is faith in God is the anchor. Faith in God is the anchor. I can tell you, life has thrown us curveballs after curveballs. We've had some very, very tough times in relation in our marriage, financially, health-wise. I've had surgeries, open-heart surgery. I've had this, and my wife has had that. You know, we've had challenges in our lives, family issues, relationship issues, uh, work issues. I cannot tell you, but this is what brings us even closer, is when we are able to pray and sh with shared values, pray together, call upon God, go to the Bible, find the scriptures that can sustain us, this is what helps, keeps us going. And so faith in God is the anchor. It's the foundation everything else is built on. When we have this in place, then all the things I've mentioned flows a bit easier. Having a shared faith, right? It provides comfort and strength and guidance through challenges. It strengthens our bond and our marriage gets to work a bit easier. Does it mean it's perfect? No. Does it mean it's free of challenges? No. But we have a God who is able to sustain us and strengthen us and comfort us and give us his peace in times of storms. And that's why faith in God is one of the highest valuable lessons we have to pass on to people. Make sure you have a shared faith with your partner. Find a way to make it happen. Find a way to make it happen. And if you're not married yet, make certain that you don't get married with someone who have an opposing idea of faith or have no faith at all. If you do, don't. It won't work. I can tell you that. I've seen it many times. So here are the top seven valuable lessons. And again, I mentioned I've just chosen these seven, but there's many more. Effective communication is key, number one. Number two, patience is priceless. Number three, love is a verb, not just a feeling. Number four, um, learn to compromise. Number five, marriage is work, but rewarding work. Number six, no longer I and my, but us and ours. And number seven, faith in God is the anchor. I would love to hear from you which of these resonated most with you. Which of these that you would even pass on to your spouse? And I do hope you allow him or her to listen to this. But if you like what you've heard and want to go deeper and want to begin by practicing having better communication with your spouse, as you heard, it's the number one thing for longevity in marriage. I've created a free resource called 28 Daily Conversation Starter Guide that you can have simply by asking. Simply go to happiermarriagesecrets.com slash start, happiermarriagesecrets.com slash start, and the link will be provided below. It's yours free for the asking. You will find things to start talking about with your partner that makes it easier.
to begin a conversation. And the more you practice doing this, the better you will become at handling the tough conversations that will come. So get your free copy of uh, at happiermarriagesecrets.com slash starts. And the links will again will be in the description below. Do so today. And you should also watch this next video where it, I share with you the top five frustrations in marriage. So watch this video right here. Now may the Lord bless you and give you his peace both now and forever. Amen. God bless. Until next time.